Lori, you founded the Center for Disaster Philanthropy in late August 2012. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the organization, why you founded it, and, and what it's doing now? Since we had been through Katrina, we had learned a lot about disasters and disaster philanthropy. We uh, kind of had felt that philanthropy is difficult in itself, and disaster philanthropy had made it uh, quite even more complex and it deserved its own center. Uh, the center itself here based in DC is actually trying to get uh, philanthropists to think more strategically about disasters um, and giving to disasters. Usually people have a real impulse to give to disasters that uh, right after um, philanthropy usually ends right about three weeks after the disaster happens, or two days after it goes right off the media. And we wanted to get, if philanthropy was actually strategic, as we saw that it could be during Katrina, and I can give examples of such, that it could really make a difference in how we um, recovered and how resilient communities could be after a going through a disaster. And, and it's interesting because you, you mentioned just a second ago that after the, 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 the real trauma of the disaster, the television cameras go away and the communities are left behind um, in ruins. And so there isn't enough attention. Or is it because there's not enough attention paid after all the cameras go away that you, something like this is required? I, d I think people uh, people have short attention spans in general, and but we live in the most um, generous country in the world, and I think people do not like to see people suffer. Uh, and when it is in, on in the mind's eye, people have a tendency to give. Uh, but there's very many ways to give throughout uh, a disaster, um, the the whole cycle of a disaster. As you can see with Hurricane Sandy, it is still going on. There is so much more to give, and we at the center want to focus uh, more on the longer term effects. And what we saw with Katrina, as we're still recovering from Katrina, is that we were hoping that philanthropists would stay involved, policymakers would stay involved, businesses and others would stay involved um, across all sectors throughout the entire um, cycles. Now, we'll talk about Sandy in just a minute, but. Bob, you um, are the Center for Disaster Philanthropy's first CEO. So you're the person that's going to work and take you know, the, the, the philosophies that the, your, your, your colleagues have established and, and, and move them forward. What are, what are some of the goals that you have um, in the short term um, right now to get the center really functioning? What, what appealed to me about the center was that it was founded by people who had had real life experiences. This wasn't some theoretical notion about another uh, ivory tower organization, but these were founders who had been involved in Katrina who knew something about what donors need. And so based on that kind of experience, we're really trying to help donors across the country better understand what roles they can play. One of the experiences that Lori and her colleagues had from Katrina was donors called them and said, we want to do something, but we don't know what to do. And we want to make sure nobody ever asks that question again, that donors will know how they can get involved, how they can work with other donors, how they can collaborate to make sure their donations have um, impact. Following the Center for Disaster Philanthropy's launch, of course you had Isaac. It was on the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Katrina that you actually right. launched, right. and Isaac descended. Right. We, we have a real, we have tough training program. <laughs> <laughs> so right. you were you were thrown right into it. Yeah. And then just a few months later, and now you're really immersed in what's going on with Sandy. Can you all both tell us a little bit about the philanthropic efforts um, related to those storms? Sure. So we started by um, trying to tell the story of local donors because often that story gets lost, that local donors are right in the heart of it. Um, they may be affected themselves where they maybe lose power or their employees lose uh, homes, um, but they know what's going on with the nonprofit community. So we started by trying to tell the story of local donors and sharing that with the rest of the country. At the same time, we were trying to help uh, donors from outside of the effective area 
know how they could help. Is it in bringing dollars? Is it in uh, supporting the local grant makers in some other way? Uh, and we started to do that with teleconferences, with um, um, inter, uh, interactive uh, information on our site. Uh, and we also created uh, our own uh, Sandy Disaster Fund, where donors who wanted to do something but were willing to take some time for th that money to be spent um, were able to contribute to the fund. And we're now going to work with local donors to make sure that that money is spent in the most effective ways in recovery and uh, rebuilding. And, and what are the lessons that, that the Center for Disaster Philanthropy is learning and has learned from both Isaac and now Sandy? Um, that can be applied to future disasters? One is that um, there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that the money's being well spent and that uh, there's good collaboration among uh, individual donors as well as institutional donors. So that's one of the things we want to be working on um, long term. To me, one of the most interesting things that came out of Sandy is it has brought up the whole issue of mitigation again. Um, we heard a little bit about th this uh, after Katrina where you uh, heard about rebuilding the, the levees and of course Army Corps of Engineers got involved in that and got a test uh, when Isaac came. But we're now starting to hear serious discussions from governors and mayors in the New York, New Jersey area about, hey, maybe we can't keep doing things the same way we've always done them. Maybe we need to start thinking about planning and preparation and mitigation in ways we've never really done. So I think that's going to be a really interesting national dialogue that we're going to begin to hear uh, uh, that we haven't heard in a serious way. What are some of the things philanthropy can really do when it comes to disasters? Yeah, so my favorite definition of philanthropy where it really makes a difference is when it takes its monies, which are considerable, and sees it as risk capital and as patient capital. And what I mean by that is the patient capital is money that can be invested in things that um, may not have an immediate return, but over the long term can really make a contribution to rebuilding healthy communities. And nobody else in the sector can do that. Corporations can't, government can't, but philanthropy has patient capital and it also has the ability to take some risks, to do some things that, again, may not have an immediate payoff, uh, may be things that might work, might not work, but no other sector of the economy can do that as well. So I look towards patient capital and risk capital for philanthropy. I think we're nimble, we're agile, and I also think we um, can be um, an honest convener when others cannot be. And I think that is something that is necessary in bringing people together to um, solve problems in communities. Thank you so much for your time, both of you. And we really look forward to a year-long series um, on these crucial issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, Andrew. Andrew.